بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. We have product over positive integer n of 1 plus alpha over n to the power n e to the beta over n minus alpha. Beta is a real number. Alpha is a positive integer. Let's denote this product by omega of alpha and beta. Taking the natural logarithm of both sides, the right-hand side is the limit as big n tends to infinity of summation, small n from 1 to big n. The summand is minus alpha plus beta over n plus n log 1 plus alpha over n. Add and subtract alpha squared over 2n. If we apply the sum to 1 over n, we get the nth harmonic number. Multiplied by beta minus alpha squared over 2, we also have the sum of these terms. Consider the function log 1 plus x, x greater than or equal to 0. These are the first four derivatives. Let's write down the Taylor polynomial of log 1 plus x about x equals 0. Log 1 plus x is log 1, which is 0, plus 1 times x minus 1 over 2 factorial times x squared. The remainder term is 2 over 3 factorial, which is 1 third. The third derivative evaluated at zeta 2 between 0 and x multiplied by x cubed. Or we can have 1 third x cubed, then a term with x to the power 4 multiplied by minus 6 over 4 factorial which is minus one fourth. We also have the fourth derivative evaluated at some zeta one, a number between zero and x. This term here is positive. So log one plus x is greater than or equal to x minus one half x squared. This is a non-positive term. Thus log one plus x is less than or equal to x minus one half x squared plus one third x cubed. We have these two inequalities. Let's apply them to log one plus alpha over n. So we replace x by alpha over n. Both are positive integers. We get that log 1 plus alpha over n is lower bounded by alpha over n minus 1 half alpha squared over n squared. The upper bound is the lower bound plus 1 third alpha cubed over n cubed. If we multiply all sides by n, we get that n log 1 plus alpha over n is lower bounded by alpha minus 1 half alpha squared over n. The upper bound has the extra term 1 third alpha cubed over n squared. From all sides, subtract alpha and add alpha squared over 2n. We get that the summand here is greater than or equal to 0 and is less than or equal to alpha cubed divided by 3n squared. Note that if we sum the upper bound n from 1 to infinity, we get a finite number. This sum is convergent. This term has the nth harmonic number, which tends to infinity as n tends to infinity. This means that if beta is greater than alpha squared over 2, we get here plus infinity and omega of alpha and beta tends to infinity. If beta is strictly less than alpha squared over 2, as n tends to infinity, this quantity tends to minus infinity. Omega, alpha, and beta tends to 0. If beta is exactly equal to alpha squared over 2, the result is a finite positive real number. We need now to investigate omega of alpha and beta when beta is equal to alpha squared over 2. Let's rewrite the summand as n log 1 plus alpha x over n minus alpha x plus alpha squared x squared over 2n. If this function of x is evaluated at 0, we get 0. If it's evaluated at 1, we get the summand here. In other words, we can think of log omega of alpha and beta as the sum over positive integer n of an integral x from 0 to 1. The integrand is the derivative of this function with respect to x. We can bring these three terms together after taking alpha as a common factor. From this term, we get 1 in the numerator. Then we have this denominator multiplied by minus 1. Then we have alpha x over n multiplied by 1 plus alpha x over n. These two terms go away. When we expand, we get alpha x over n, which goes away with that minus alpha x over n. We end up with alpha squared x squared over n squared in the numerator and 1 plus alpha x over n in the denominator. We can take this 1 over n squared and write it as 1 over n. When we multiply this term by n, we get n plus alpha x. Here is x squared. Alpha squared times alpha is alpha cubed. Assuming that we can interchange the order of summation and integration, we get alpha cubed integral x from 0 to 1, x squared times the sum over positive integer n of 1 over n times n plus alpha x. This summation can be expressed using the digamma function, the logarithmic derivative of the gamma function. The digamma function of z is minus a small gamma, Euler Mascaroni constant, plus summation over non-negative integer g of 1 over g plus 1 minus 1 over g plus z. If n is equal to g plus 1, when g is 0, n is 1, when g tends to infinity, n tends to infinity, the sum becomes 1 over n minus 1 over n minus 1 plus z. If we combine these two terms, we get n times n plus z minus 1. Upstairs, we get n plus z minus 1 minus n. Assuming that z is not equal to 1, this summation is equal to digamma of z plus small gamma divided by z minus 1.
if we replace z minus one here by alpha x, we get that summation over positive integer n of one over n over n plus alpha x equal to one over alpha x times small gamma plus di gamma of alpha x plus one. X squared over x is equal to x. Using the properties of the di gamma function, we can write down this di gamma of alpha x plus one as di gamma of alpha x plus one over alpha x. The integrand is x di gamma of alpha x plus one over alpha plus small gamma x. Multiplying by alpha squared, we get alpha plus alpha squared small gamma x plus alpha squared x di gamma of alpha x. Integrating these two terms, x from zero to one, we get alpha plus one half alpha squared small gamma. We still have this integral alpha squared x from zero to one, x di gamma of alpha x. Let's use the substitution y equal to alpha x. This means that alpha squared x dx is equal to y dy. This y is multiplied by di gamma of y. y is from zero to alpha. Di gamma of y is the first derivative with respect to y of the logarithm of the gamma function. We do integration by parts. We get minus the integral y from zero to alpha of log gamma of y dy. The product of y and log gamma of y when y is equal to alpha is alpha log gamma of alpha. We need to take the limit of this quantity as y approaches zero from above. We can make use of the product representation of the gamma function after taking the logarithm and multiplying by y. Minus small gamma y squared tends to zero as y tends to zero. Y log y also tends to zero as y tends to zero. To verify this, we can use L'Hopital's rule. We can write down y log y as log y over one over y. The numerator tends to minus infinity as y tends to zero from above. The denominator tends to infinity. Applying L'Hopital, this limit is the limit of the ratio of the first derivatives, which is one over y divided by minus one over y squared. This is minus y. The limit is indeed equal to zero as y tends to zero. On the previous page, we have derived this inequality here. Multiplying both sides by minus one, we get minus log one plus y over n less than or equal to minus y over n plus one half y squared over n squared. Add y over n to both sides. We get that the summand here is upper bounded by y squared over two n squared. Y log gamma y is upper bounded by minus a small gamma y squared minus y log y plus one half y squared times y times the sum over positive integer n of one over n squared. The sum is zeta of two, which is y squared over six. Over the interval from zero to one, the gamma function is strictly decreasing. Gamma of one is equal to one. And for any y greater than zero and less than or equal to one, gamma of y is greater than or equal to one. So the logarithm of gamma of y is greater than or equal to zero. Y times log gamma of y is non-negative. If we go back to the upper bound, note that it tends to zero as y tends to zero from above by the squeeze theorem. This limit here is equal to zero. Log omega of alpha and beta is equal to this expression here when beta is alpha squared over two. We need now to tackle this integral y from zero to alpha of log gamma of y. Define the function f of e as the integral of the log gamma function x from e to e plus one. If we differentiate with respect to e, we get log gamma of e plus one minus log gamma of e, which is log gamma e plus one over gamma of e. The numerator is e gamma of e. The first derivative of f is log e. The integral of log e is e log e minus the integral of e over e. This is e log e minus e plus the integration constant c. We know from the previous page that this a log a tends to zero as a tends to zero from above. Thus, the integration constant c can be obtained by taking the limit of this function as a tends to zero from above. In other words, c is the integral x from zero to one log gamma of x. If we replace x by one minus x, we get integral x from zero to one of log gamma of one minus x. c is the arithmetic mean of these two integrals. So we have one half integral x from zero to one log gamma of x plus log gamma one minus x, which is the logarithm of the product. Using the reflection formula, we can write down this product as pi over sine by x. The integrand is log pi minus log sine by x. C is equal to one over two log pi minus one half integral x from zero to one log sine by x. Sine by x is symmetric about one half. We can write down this integral as double the integral x from zero to one half of log sine by x. This integral is equal to the integral x from zero to one half log cosine by x. We obtain this by replacing x here by one half minus x and using the relation that sine by over two minus theta is cosine theta. If we integrate x from zero to one half log sine two by x, we can write sine two by x as two sine by x cosine by x. Log sine two by x is log two plus log sine by x plus log cosine by x. Integrating this term from zero to one half, we get i. We also get i when we integrate this term from zero to one half, we get two i. Lastly, we have the integral of log two x from zero to one half, that's log two over two. We can evaluate this integral in another way Use the substitution y equal to 2x when x is 0, y is 0, when x is 1 half, y is 1. Using this symmetry, 
we can write down this integral times one half as integral x from zero to one half log sine by x, which is all. We have evaluated this integral in two ways. In the first, we get the result to i plus log two over two. In the second, we get i. This means that i is equal to minus log two over two. C is equal to one half log by minus this quantity. So we have plus one half log two. C is log two by divided by two. The integral x from a to a plus one log gamma of x is a log a minus a plus log two by over two. Consider positive integer alpha. If we integrate log gamma of x, x from zero to alpha, this integral is equal to the integral from zero to one plus the integral from one to two, all the way to the integral from alpha minus one to alpha. In other words, this integral is f of zero plus f of one all the way to f of alpha minus one. Given that f is the integral of log gamma of x from a to a plus one. We have a formula for f of a. It is a log a minus a plus one half log two by. If we apply the sum to this constant, we just multiply the constant by the number of terms in the sum, which is alpha. Then we have minus the sum a from zero to alpha minus one of a. That's one half alpha minus one times alpha. Lastly, we have summation a from zero to alpha minus one log a to the power a. The sum of logarithms is the log of the product. Log omega of alpha and alpha squared over two is alpha log gamma of alpha, which is log gamma of alpha to the power alpha, which is equal to log alpha minus one factorial to the power alpha. We can multiply and divide by alpha to the alpha. We get log alpha factorial to the power alpha divided by alpha to the power alpha. We have alpha, one half alpha, alpha minus one. Adding, we get one half alpha, alpha plus one. We have one half alpha squared, small gamma, minus log two by to the power alpha over two, minus this logarithm. If beta is equal to alpha squared over two, omega of alpha and beta is equal to alpha factorial to the power alpha over alpha to the alpha times e to the one half alpha, alpha plus one, times e to the one half alpha squared, small gamma, over two pi to the power alpha over two. Downstairs, we also have this product, m from one to alpha minus one. We can use this term and write the product, small m from one to alpha, m to the power m. The result that we have here can be extended to a positive real number alpha if we replace this factorial of alpha by gamma of alpha plus one. And if this product here is replaced by the hyperfactorial of alpha, typically denoted by h of alpha.